He's long been considered a crucial piece of the Gents' midfield, but Casey Wehrman was left out of the weekend's loss to the victory, a casualty of coach Gary Van Egmond's tough new regime. Unfortunately, Casey's come out publicly and, and stated a few things, and if he comes out and states that publicly, it obviously makes my decision very easy. It all started last Thursday when Wehrman made comments to a website regarding the Jets' new playing style. Now there's speculation the 34-year-old could be transferred elsewhere. Neither club officials or Van Egmond would comment today, while the players appear united behind their coach. Gary sat us aside this morning and sort of said, you know, this is where we want to go, just to stick together. Um, you know, Gary's said how he wants to play and that's how it's going to be. As for this weekend's clash, Nikolai Topol Stanley should return from a corked thigh. Tarek Elrich will live to fight another day. He's suspended. That means Ruben Zankovic is likely to return to the back line. Players remain hungry for their first win away from home in more than a year. We've been practicing so much on just possession and keeping the ball and you know now we need to turn that into going forward and uh, creating opportunities. Kevin Metham, NBN News. This is what some of the world's best amateurs have come to Belmont for, and of course the coveted Lake Macquarie crown. Plenty of locals are taking notice, and with shots like this one from Redcliffe's Ellen Davies Graham, it's easy to see why it earned her a birdie on the fifth. But the real success story is New Zealand's Sarah Bradley. It's hard to imagine that four years ago, an horrific car crash caused amnesia and set her back 18 months. Today, she looked like a pro, producing four birdies to finish even. It'll be a tough job chasing down Brianna Elliott. The defending champion got out of trouble several times for an early lead. The Arawonga amateur eventually finished with six birdies to post a first round score of four under. That's a three shot lead. But if punts like these landed, it would have been much more. Kevin Metham, NBN News. Shortly after unions were briefed about members' uncertain futures, Hedro's senior vice president announced the move to the media. We would like to close line one as, as soon as possible uh, because it will have a, a positive financial impact uh, on the plant. When production line one, the oldest of the plant's three lines goes, so too will 150 jobs. That's close to a third of the 500 strong workforce. Contractors will also be affected. We're still, uh, still devastated for our members and, and, and the staff. It's going to bring about um, uh, a drop in morale, obviously. Uh, it's going to um, uh, play on people's um, psyche. Hedro says it had no choice given dropping metal prices and the strong Australian dollar. Higher power prices were also a factor in the decision, but Hedro says uncertainty over its electricity contract 
wasn't. The senior vice president wouldn't speculate on whether the entire plant could close, except to say the financial times are difficult. The Curry Business Chamber says today's move isn't as devastating as full closure, but it's still bad news for the region. It's going to have a significant impact on the, uh, on the Cessnock LGA, but more particularly it's on the Hunter region. It's another kick in the guts for the Hunter uh, that uh, manufacturing has been knocked about. But it's the other spin-offs, it's the local belt contractor that supplies, it's the, the, the takeaway food joints, it's the, um, the trucking companies, you know, like these guys all, it's all related. Unions will continue to negotiate with Hydro over redundancies and an employment pathways program. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. One month since Council last voted on the issue, it seems the community can't stop talking about the figs. While ever the trees are up, they're up, and uh, it's worth pursuing um, the issue to sort of keep them up. The forum's been organised by Brian Havenhand, who says the whole fiasco has confused the average ratepayer. And I think there's a lot of common sense that has left this debate, and I think it's time that we got back to something that was a bit more, you know, level-headed and appropriate. And the Newcastle businessman has organised two keynote speakers, Professor of Civil Engineering Mark Stewart and UK-based arborist Mike Ellison, who was commissioned by Save Our Figs to assess the trees. He wasn't allowed inside the fence because the council wouldn't allow that and uh, he's since put a report together and that report's going to be delivered publicly on Monday night. Mr Havenhand is also hoping an anti-fig councillor will address the forum. We're not overly hopeful at this stage. They have been offered a public debate before but refused. The forum will be held at City Hall on Monday night. Anyone who wants to post questions for the Q&A segment can email figforum at gmail.com. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. A closed corner store, a sad reflection of what's befalling Catherine Hill Bay. The bowling club shut late last year and now the defining feature of the seaside suburbs coastline is on borrowed time. I cannot see a future for the jetty, it's been left far too long. Rose Group's 500 lot subdivision designed to bring shops and services to a village which is still without town water is still at least five years away. It's something that's desperately needed in this area, especially for our older residents to have access to these types of amenities that every community should have. The upkeep of the jetty and relocation of the bowling club were originally in the plans, but an objection to the development in the Land and Environment Court saw the idea dropped. There's a lot of things that could have been saved between in the last 10 years um, just by negotiation. Another dispute last year resulted in council being given the power to sign off on the aesthetics of all new houses built in the Rose Group development. We would like to see development that is similar in style to development that's occurring at Murray's Beach rather than seeing the more common brick and tile dwellings. The majority of dwellings here operate as holiday homes, which means for a good part of the year they're vacant. It's this lack of a consistent population which has slowly killed off all the services. So would you say the, the life's being sucked out of you? Oh yes, love, and uh, just quietly, I'm that close uh, to selling the house that I built 31 years ago, before the hysterical society tried to stop me. Kath Landers, NBN News.
I was watching the news last year, rung a mate of mine, uh, Gibbo, and said to him, we've got to do something about this, and he said, what do you suggest? I said, I've got a big toolbox here, let's cut a hole in it and go around and collect money and take it to them on the bikes. The Empire Park skate facility at Bar Beach is well and truly on the map, recognised by industry professionals as one of Australia's most progressive skate parks. Over the Australia Day long weekend, it will host the inaugural National Bowl Riding Championships. For a long time, uh, bowl skating didn't really have the depth of talent for Australia to put on like a, a competition of its own for Australians. It's always been pro, uh, it's always had people from all around the world, but I guess now we've got so many good skaters in Masters, girls, pro and under 18s that we can put on one massive day of bowl skating for Australians. Built with federal and local government funds, the skate park is maintained by Newcastle Council and the local skateboarding community, from which new talent is already emerging. There's a lot of really good young skaters um, I think in the future, skaters from here are possibly going to dominate because they have one of the best skate parks in Australia. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. I'll make a comment they should do their recruitment before the season, not halfway through the season. I'm a fan of Stewie Michalik as a footballer. I think I've shown that over the years and uh, there's no way Stewie's leaving and uh, especially not up the road to Newcastle. At Townsend Oval, Merriweather has been busy preparing to play on one of the country's most famous grounds. On Sunday, the side will try and reclaim the tag of best country club in New South Wales. Here at the SCG, it's won the title twice before, most recently in 2008, but it'll be opener Josh Geary's first attempt. Days ago, he smashed a century in the local 2020 comp, and he isn't tweaking his preparation one bit. If you sort of try and make it too special or change anything, you know, you might sort of go away from your normal game plan and just whatever got us there is probably what's going to work. Paceman Sam Gilmore has a similar mindset, but he admits spearheading the attack at the historic venue is an exciting prospect. We're getting the opportunity to play at the SCG week after the 100th test, so yeah, cannot wait. Captain Simon Moore will return later this week from New South Wales country duties along with three others, including all-rounder Pat Darwin, who's been copping some friendly digs since arriving at the start of the season. He has. He's brought his Sydney Metro sexuality to the yeah. team, so no, he's fitting in perfectly and um, yeah, he's a real pleasure to play with and adds a lot to our side. Kevin Metham, NBN News. Training on the rugged tracks of Glenrock suits Celia Sullihern just fine. It's a reason the move from the Blue Mountains was so smooth. Yeah, for me, for, definitely. I love it out here, just getting away from everything. You can sort of escape the world for a few hours and, yeah, just enjoy running. Last year, the University of Newcastle students smashed a 6Ks to claim the under-20s national cross-country title. 
The athletics track takes a different sort of mental toughness and Sullihan admits that doesn't come easy. Yeah, you do hit a point where yeah, the body says stop, but you've got to sort of tell it to keep going. Now the 19-year-old is looking to start the new year the way she ended it, on a winning note. She's stepping up to the senior ranks over 1,500 metres for the Hunter Track Classic on January 21. Yeah, it is my first one and it's a lot shorter than I usually do, so I'm just hoping to get a bit of speed, go for a fast time and enjoy this amazing meet. Kevin Metham, NBN News. Five hectares of bushland up in flames. NBN News cameraman Oivind Newman captured the moment the blaze ignited at around 9pm. We saw a uh, power pole sort of making sparks and uh, the sparks were flying making embers into the dry grass and uh, we thought it didn't look very safe so we rang Triple O and, um, and uh, yeah, within a couple of minutes before the fire brigade even got there the, the bush was sort of properly a light. He then recorded these images with his mobile phone. The blaze quickly spread from the roadside to inaccessible bushland. Homes near the old Aero Pelican strip were evacuated as a precaution. Last night there were some, I guess, some, some moments there where um, there was property on certain flanks, um, but at no time there was there, there were actually houses at, at risk. By 4am the blaze was contained. Today firefighters weren't about to let the flames flare again, deploying four crews and water bombing helicopters. It's a very important resource in this type of uh, incident, especially where you've got inaccessible areas. It provides a resource that, that is invaluable in, in this uh, scenario. It's the first significant blaze to break out in the Newcastle area this summer. Osgrid suspects the sparks may have been caused by vandals throwing wire across overhead power lines. Police are investigating. Madeline McKell, NBN News. It's a workforce being sent to the chopping block. We we're taking a number of actions across the organisation to, uh, to look at how we can reduce costs. Um, regrettably, that will mean that we'll be also looking at ways we can work safely and cleanly and, and produce what we produce with fewer people. Around 100 fewer people, in fact. Tomigo says its hand has regrettably been forced. Like Hydro Aluminium, it's citing declining metal costs coupled with a low Aussie dollar. It means for, for Tomigo that we do need to take action now to, uh, to strengthen our organisation and to, to make it capable to, to, to ride through this period and be strong into the future. And maintain the $1.5 billion it generates for the national economy every year and $500 million for the hunter. Certainly the announcement that we've seen in the last few days is, is not the way that we would have liked to have started 2012 but I think the thing that we've got to remember is that the Hunter economy is a resilient economy and we will work through this. Of the 1,200 strong workforce, it's not known where the majority of losses will come from. What we're concerned about from the business chamber's point of view is the flow on effect, the multipliers in terms of the contractors and the suppliers. Over 540,000 tonnes of aluminium is produced here at Tomigo every year. But despite the job losses, the company says output won't change. 
I think we really need to face the fact that uh, to survive well into the future and to get through this period of low demand and low prices, we need to do things differently. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. He's one of Newcastle's living legends. Not only did Mark Richards win five surfing world titles, but his daily presence at MR Surfboards has kept him very much in the public eye. But those days are numbered, with a store his parents opened in 1958 set to permanently close its doors on Saturday. It's an end of an era for the surf shop, but it's not an end of the era for Mark Richard surfboards. So I'll still be shaping surfboards and the boards will still be available. Um, just the location you buy them from will be different. Several factors have led to the move. His store's location on Hunter Street's West End, just the start of them. What's happening in small business is the costs keep going up all the time. Um, you know, council charges, government charges, um, you know, power and water charges. They just seem as though they are on a continual go up all the time but you can't keep increasing the margins on boards. Richards has mixed emotions about shutting up shop but the closure will have one big silver lining. Maybe a bit more time for surfing. Um, yeah it sounds good. <laughs> Can never have enough time for surfing. Madeline McKell, NBN News. They were out in force, on the ground and in the air. Not your usual police operation, today was more a meet and greet. It's a fantastic opportunity for the community to come and meet our local police and our specialist police. There were fast cars and flashing lights along with some well-trained canines. But the main attraction, the police helicopter or Polair and what an entrance it made. Tell me, what did you think of the police helicopter? It was exciting. It was awesome and exciting. It was a welcome return home to Newcastle for crew member Andrew Burnell. The thing I love the most, I suppose, is actually getting out and, you know, we go to a few, a few different areas and it's great to get out and actually just meet a, a variety of police from all different places. But there's a serious side to Polair's visit. It'll be used in a four-day operation in the Hunter. We'll be asking them to attend any job, for example, search for a missing person, perhaps somebody lost it uh, out swimming at the beach, anything like that, we'll be asking them to come, come along and assist us. And after today's visit, police may have a few more hands to help out further down the track. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. It's becoming something of a summer holiday tradition. Around 100 St Joseph's students pulling out all stops to work with children and adults from Musselbrook's Overton House for the All Stars concert. The cast and crew from Overton House range from 8 years old to 65 and according to organisers from Integrated Living Australia, work like one big happy family with the students. All Stars is a wonderful experience. I really enjoy it every single year and I make a lot of great friends. Like these people are in a house with about 30 of their friends that they see every day, day in, day out, and there's nothing in society for them. So we come up here and put on a show and give them some attention. The theme of this year's show is time travel, and rehearsals and workshops in everything from food to music, drama and art have been running all week. The show opens at St Joseph's School Hall on Saturday night. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. He spent the week quietly doing his job at training, but off the field, Casey Wehrman recently questioned his new coach's style. Now he may never play for the Jets again. Reconciliation with Gary Van Egmond seems unlikely. Not so, uh, not so pleasant, shall we say. Um, we're still a little bit um, apart in regards to, to dialogue. He still has you know, my respect and he's still training with us, so, and, and obviously he's respecting the, the training environment, and, and while that happens, it's... No problem. 
The transfer window opens in a few days and there was speculation Mariners midfielder Stu Majalik was a replacement candidate after Van Egmond attended a recent youth game. I know um, his game inside and out so it wasn't a case of us going down there for Stuart but you know the papers want to speculate. I mean it actually brings my attention to even more players that I might not have even thought about. Right now the focus is the Mariners on Saturday and with one win from the Jets past six games there's been criticism of the side's possession based short pass style. Now if that proves to be unsuccessful well I'm the one then who uh, will be uh, putting my head on the chopping block but uh, I won't compromise. This won't help. Injuries have again ruled out striker Francis Jeffers and captain Joe Wilhouse. Kevin Metham, NBN News. Training in her own backyard is a must for Ella Rose Hugo. After all, the compound archer shoots up to 150 arrows a day and at the age of 16, it's a welcome distraction. Yes, it is. It's so relaxing. You just feel like, oh, I need to get away from everyone. <laughs> At the National Youth Championships last week, she was unstoppable. There were first places in five disciplines, including target, field, clout and match play, while her state team also shot gold. At first I was a bit shocked. I'm like, did I actually do this? But then it finally sunk in. I'm like, oh wow, I actually have. It earned her Australian selection and making it even more amazing. Ella Rose only picked up a compound bow three years ago. A connective tissue disorder made dislocations way too common in contact sports, so archery was an easy choice. Keeping her mind on target isn't as simple, but this teenager seems to have it all figured out. I find the more I focus on the outcome, the more I shoot bad, whereas if I focus on the process and keep everything in form and on time, I shoot a whole lot better. Mum is always close by, but she admits that'll soon change. Letting go, she's becoming so independent. Um, and that's the hardest part. <laughs> Still, she'll join Ella Rose in New Zealand for the Trans-Tasman Championships in March. Kevin Metham, NBN News. There are a number through intelligence that we think are linked uh, and that was the original uh, reason why we set up the strike force uh, and there are other groups so there's a number of groups working at the same time so that's why we're going to have some additional resources.
Despite its healthy appearance, what you see on the surface of the Mile River, gateway to the Mile Lakes, is only half the story. It used to be pristine, but now the river's not real good. You see it gradually declining and declining and declining. According to these locals, that's because the system isn't flushing. Since the original channel has uh, choked up, the river's just becoming increasingly more uh, dirty. But that's just the start. The blues on the crabs, you can't get them up here anymore. Um, and the, the sores on the fish, which is very concerning. The fish have all got sores on them, and they're down towards the tail mainly, but this year they got them up around the head and everywhere. It's all forced the state government to step in. Today, Port Stephens MP Craig Bowman announced the creation of a task force to help find a solution. He's also pushing for a slice of this year's state budget and some funding from the federal government to help bring the system back to full health. The up and coming generations really need this river to come back to its original or as close to its original uh, standard as possible so they can enjoy the river as we've enjoyed the river over the years as old blokes. Tyson Cottrell, NBN News. He's provided plenty of highlights for the Jets so far this season. But Jeremy Brockie knows there's still work to be done if he's going to extend his stay at Osgrid Stadium. I love it here in Newcastle. Um, I'm nice and settled and, and my partner's settled, so uh, hopefully I can keep performing on the pitch and, uh, and keep scoring goals and, and keep helping the team perform. Ryan Griffith's late strike against the victory saw Brocky slip behind in the race to be Newcastle's leading goal scorer. We've got a little, uh, I guess it's a little competition going on, but at the end of the day I'm, I'm more worried about three points. The Jets are likely to stick with a similar starting 11 to the one which lost to Melbourne. Tarek Elrich's suspension means Ruben Zadkovic will take his place in defence. It's been more than a year since Newcastle won away from home, but players and coaches say the controversy surrounding Casey Werman's playing future hasn't hurt preparations. You'd like to have plain sailing every week, but that's, that's sport, you know, that's football. Um, it doesn't happen and I think the players understand that and um, it, it hasn't affected them to be honest. In a welcome boost, Joe Wheelhouse's infected foot has responded well to a cortisone injection and the captain is confident he's on the road to recovery. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.
three feisty female American alligators intent on protecting their nest with their very lives. It's the first time the dangerous reptiles have bred at the Hunter Valley Zoo and zookeepers were understandably a little nervous about the egg raid. She's going to charge and be aggressive, but if we can pick where she comes up, then it makes it easier for the nest raider to know exactly where to be. Armed with a mere stick and a few tasty chicken carcasses, keepers tried to make this cranky mum keep her distance. And it wasn't long before the clutch was uncovered and the careful collection could begin. With all reptile eggs, the actual embryo sticks to the shell of the inside of the egg. So what we've got to do is try and place these guys in a situation where they're upright in the same position that they are here now in the incubator. A total of 14 eggs were found in the first nest. She's only a really small female to have bred, so, um, so yeah, no, we're stoked. Attention then turned to this huge mound where not only a mum but a gigantic dad waited and tempers flared. No eggs there just yet, but the raid was absolutely necessary. Under our legislation, we actually have to take American alligator eggs out of the nest and incubate them artificially because those guys can survive in rivers and streams all around Australia. The eggs will now be transported to a secret location in the Hunter Valley where they'll go into a special incubator for the next 60 days before they hatch. Madeline McKell, NBN News. It was hardly beach weather at Blacksmith's this morning, but you won't hear these boaties complaining. It's days like these that can make or break preparations for an assault on the Aussie titles. The crews have got to be hardened to that condition. Some good days and some bad days, and, and certainly at the national titles, we row over a number of days. At Karawa, uh, anything can happen. It's headgear and mouthguard country. Swansea Belmont's Dean Elvin wouldn't be anywhere else. The surf boat veteran sweeps for the club's successful men's and women's under-23 crews. He believes both teams have the potential to challenge for a national medal. In a final, I think finals row themselves. Uh, if they make the final, luck's a lottery. Elvin has his troops on a heavy training schedule preparing for the state titles at Kingscliff before they look to fulfil their potential at the nationals on the Gold Coast. Well, I think everyone's aiming you know, for Aussie goal but um, we've got a lot of carnivals in between those, so just all warming up for the big dance. The crews continued their impressive form in the Peters series today, but the sweep still has some tricks up his sleeve for the bigger carnivals. I like to settle them down into a technique row uh, and, and bring their stroke rate down, uh, work on the, on the leg and the breath. Uh, and then we've got a few little schemes that I'd hate to give me strategies away, mate.
Mike Ellison arrived late last year, bringing more than three decades of experience. In fact, the arborist's method of assessing the health of trees is used around the world, according to his new report commissioned by Save Our Finks. In a worst-case scenario, the chances of someone losing their life on Layman Street is around 1 in 170,000 per year. Cities all over the world are full of trees that are growing in positions like this with root plates like this and we don't have an epidemic of tree failures in cities. Council stands by its argument that the root systems are dangerous because they haven't been able to grow properly, adding there is a huge body of evidence to support the case, but it's argued the nature of the soil has helped develop deep root systems which remain strong. You may cut a root say 30 years ago, but in fact that tree will actually change to cope with that. The findings will be debated at an open forum tomorrow night. Another expert risk assessment professor, Mark Stewart, will also speak. The risk of these trees might be a bit higher than perhaps your typical tree, but it's not 500,000 times higher. <laughs> and, I, and that's the point, is that, uh, that the numbers have been, have been used so far just seem extraordinarily high and they're just not believable. They're just not believable. In the meantime, expect more scenes like these when contractors arrive with chainsaws sometime this week. Kevin Metham, NBN News. We're turning people away all the time and, and this time of year in particular, right through till May, is a very popular time. There's just so much to look at and you have you kind of make up your mind as to what you want and then there's other things going on and you're like, oh, but that looks nice too. The Jets had the best early chances before Jeremy Brocky teed up Labano Haliti for the opener. The squadron was making all the noise, but their happiness was short-lived. Tiago's foul earned him a yellow card and a week suspension. Just a minute later, the referee was the only one in the ground who thought this was handball. But Troy Hearfield couldn't make his former club pay. Both sides had their chances early in the second half before the Central Coast tied things up. The Jets showed plenty of fighting spirit to earn just their second point away from home this season. It feels a little bit like a loss because of the, the way that the game panned out and we're pretty disappointed with ourselves that we've um, conceded off a, off a set piece. Van Egmond is now looking for his squad to convert more missed opportunities as he continues to ignore the critics. Someone said to me the other day, they said if you start listening to the fans, you'll start sitting with the fans.
A swollen face, a few bumps and soon to be bruises, taxi driver Lance Painter says he's lucky to be alive. It could have got a lot worse, so uh, thank God it didn't get as bad as it could have got. He was set upon last night at around 8 on the corner of Hunter and Stewart Avenue. A man was being attacked in his cab by three fellow passengers. They didn't uh, take too kind to that guy and sort of punched into him and I just tried to you know, protect him and said, mate, guys, take it outside and, and leave him alone kind of thing and then they started punching into me. Thankfully, they didn't hit his head. The 41-year-old has a piece of his skull missing from a previous injury and such a blow could have been deadly. It comes five months after a brutal incident which left a 62-year-old grandfather toothless. We still can't get a result on that one. The industry is reminding customers drivers are just trying to earn a living. It's just so disheartening to find that we've got all these fellows trying to do the right thing and for questionable young fellows decide to bash him up because he asks them not to fight in his taxi. Police are investigating the attack. Newcastle taxis will now work towards introducing a prepaid system that would keep passenger records to help protect its own. Kevin Metham, NBN News. It was inevitable Hydro's part closure would affect more than its 150 employees who will wind up out of work. Western Aluminium recycles dross from the curry smelter. It's already talking about scaling down production, meaning more local job losses. We're trying to work at the moment to stabilise our workforce, stabilise our operation and diversify into other activities. It's genuine and it's going to be far more significant than just the 150 jobs at Hydro. Weston's concerned about the long-term viability of Hydro and the manufacturing industry itself, suffering under the weak Aussie dollar and falling metal prices. We need to see some reform from the government, certainly some support with Hydro for extension of their power contract. The New South Wales opposition has its own solution to mass job losses. It wants the Premier to axe his government's $280 million relocation scheme. They were saying that 10,000 people would access this money, $7,000 to move to regional New South Wales. Only 190 people have actually accessed it. Accessed it. And implement its plan. This money uh, would support those workers in finding another job. It would also help businesses restructure. A spokesperson for the Deputy Premier says the government's scheme aims to support balanced population growth and will see 40,000 new jobs in regional areas. Lauren Bladwell, NBN News. It's been more than four months since the federal government committed $7 million for the Newcastle Art Gallery. The O'Farrell government still hasn't come to the party. Today's state member for Newcastle, Tim Owen, said he expects the coalition to fulfil his request and match the Gillard government. Meanwhile, Newcastle Council is pushing ahead. It's put the call out for designs. 
it signals the beginning of our future and uh, we've, we're very excited about that. The plan is to knock down the back section of the gallery. It would enable it to double its exhibition space and add a theatre, cafe and shop that would extend all the way to Derby Street. So there's an expectation that there would be state support for this. Particularly we see this development as being about cultural tourism and the rebuilding and revitalisation of Newcastle. Only 2% of the gallery's collection is currently on show with thousands of works in storage such as this 194 year old picture of Newcastle. Art lovers are keen to see that and more. It's a bit of a waste if you have all that uh, artwork available and all that more of Newcastle could see that's not shown, yes. Kevin Metham, NBN News. It's been a long time been studying for five years and so it's exciting now to be earning a wage and feeling responsible and, and having a role within the community. It's a fantastic career. You get to meet lots of interesting people and hopefully help them in some way. And it's a really dynamic career as well. It's, every day is different. Starting in 1962 and running for 20 years, Jay's Travel Time gave us ideas on where to spend our holidays. From train tours throughout New South Wales to South Pacific cruises, Travel Time was a televised brochure on where to go and how to get there. Alongside Jim Jenkins, Roy Earl gave us the weekly travel update. Things didn't always go according to plan. When the tourist boat Tamboy Queen was launched at Port Stephens in 1970, Roy Earl reported the details of the boat's facilities, like how many seats and how many toilets. So while we're sitting like rehearsing it, I happened to say she had um, 82 forward-facing toilet seats. And I, and I said, to be careful you don't say that again, because well, I'm live then in those days, it's live, there's no video there. So you wouldn't want to know when they come up to do the thing, what did I do? went to air, <laughs> nobody, nobody took it in, no, except the general public. I can walk about down the street and they say, how are the toilet seats going on the Tamboy Queen? Grey clouds hovered overhead, but a big crowd still made it trackside for round two. Following the opening event in Brisbane, Queenslander Davey Watt needed to put pressure on defending champion Chris Holder. A win in the first heat had him on the right track. Hunter riders Sam Masters and Rowan Tungate defied the odds to finish in the top four in round one. They were outclassed by Central Coaster Taylor Poole early on, but their nights would only get better. When Holder hit the track, he immediately put on a show. Starting third from the inside, he quickly asserted his dominance before celebrating in style. Masters' next performance wasn't quite as polished. He fell behind early but continued to edge his way forward until a dramatic pass set up the win. His next effort was just as gritty as he fought his way into the A final. Despite his local knowledge, Tungate had everyone feeling a little dusty, but he recovered to edge into the B final. 
In the end, they all played second fiddle to the best in the business. Holder finished the night undefeated before cruising to victory in the decider. Where he even let his rivals celebrate with him. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. The Jets may be sitting in ninth, but they still know how to draw a crowd. More than 600 junior fanatics packed onto Osgrid Stadium. At times it was hard to tell who was having the most fun. At just 19, Ben Kantorowski isn't that much older than his fans. It's been a tough 12 months for the teenager following a knee reconstruction, but his performance against the Mariners proved he's almost back to his best. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of sort of knowing that I could do the job beforehand and then making sure that I was sort of fully fit and ready to do the job. Ben Kennedy has endured his own ups and downs. His confidence is also on the rise after keeping out former teammate Troy Hearfield from the spot. We played nationals together, juniors and that, so I'm, um, you know, same age and that, so he was actually my captain for the nationals, so um, I was confident he was going to go that way and luckily he did. The Jets face the Phoenix on Friday and they'll do it without the suspended Thiago Calvano. In a boost, Francis Jeffers is a chance of returning, as is Joe Wheelhouse. He's still got a little bit of pain, we're just going to have a look at uh, seeing how we can um, monitor a few things for him to, to make his comfort le level a little bit better and, uh, and then we'll make a decision. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Lehman Street Fig advocates crammed into Newcastle City Hall last night, time and again questioning the validity of Council's reports on the now condemned trees. Today, Council arborist Phil Hewitt hit back, outlining the methods behind his and other Council reports and categorically dismissing those with differing opinions about the tree's safety. Nothing that has been put to us by um, others, say our figs for instance, um, who've uh, brought in opinions from other people, um, has changed our view. Mr Hewitt maintains the figs are dangerous, primarily because of their restricted root system, which doesn't have enough room to expand. He says roots have been repeatedly damaged by utility companies and are wounded. Claims Council's reports have exaggerated the risk posed by the trees were also laughed off. For our purposes, the people who have made those claims about exaggeration um, have themselves extremely limited knowledge about the Lama Street figs. Council's general manager is expected to soon give the order for their removal. Some 26% of our figs now have failed and that in itself is, an, is, is enough to concern us to the point where we need to take some action. Madeleine McKell, NBN News.